sobering to realize that if you put, off, put evolution onto a year scale, we're only six seconds old. Homo sapiens only six seconds old. And that raises the question, what's going to happen in the next second or millisecond? I think we're all born as policymakers, but it may also be important for us not just to try to make policy, but to actually ask, where are we going? What is inevitable in science? And I think that, I mean, we can have a lot of discussions about that, and uh, there have been many of these um, observations made already in this meeting. But I think that we could perhaps think of three key revolutions that are going to happen in the 21st century. We've already heard a lot of that. We're moving from a cottage industry, a cottage industry science, into factory-style science. Um, the preeminent example of that, of course, is the Human Genome Project, the Allen Atlas Project. And this is just the beginning. Because if you look at the bioservices industry, the commercial industry, it's actually exploding in terms of genomics, proteomics, anatomy, staining, virtually almost so many things um, you can have done by ordering it. This is a difficult thing for us as scientists to deal with because the data can now be obtained. The reason why it's inevitable is simply because it's faster and cheaper. If you had to do a calculation how much it would cost the Allen Brain Atlas to do it in the lab, it's about a billion dollars. A billion dollars in 100 years. That's what it would have taken if we had done it in the lab. NSF would have had to give that amount of money to lots of labs. So it is inevitable. This is something you can set as many policies as you want. This is something that is happening and it's going to permeate all aspects of science. The second thing, of course, is the data that it generates. It's generating exponentially more and more data. It is flooding us with data. And we face exactly the dilemma here. What do we do with it? How do we organize it? And can we get knowledge from it? <clears throat> And I think if you listen to Robert Williams, you already see some of the forward thinking in terms of this. There is no doubt that you can obtain an enormous amount of knowledge for this, and you can have a lot of debate and arguments about that. The Allen Atlas is already revealing that just from having their data, they can already start inferring and obtaining a lot of new knowledge. I think another very good example is the Mayo Clinic. You may know, or you may not know, that they have about 4.4 million records of patients over 50 years. The power of that database is absolutely phenomenal. Somebody comes in, they decide what should they treat them with. Well, they see what gender they are, what age they are, what ethnicity they are, and they find out which is the best treatment that's going to help that specific person. It's a completely different way of doing medicine. Puts the medical doctor a little bit to the side. So, and I think that there are even many more examples of that. Once you have the industry generating this data, you have the informatics putting this data out there and starting to mine it, it also doesn't just help to database. Ultimately, you need to have some way to put it into a single package and to test your understanding of the data, to test your hypothesis of the data. And that is what I see as simulation-based science. Now, that may sound like something new. It's absolutely not new. It's very common in many other fields of science. In life science, we're living actually a little bit in the dark ages. Simulation-based research is an inevitable trajectory and an outcome when you have enough knowledge, data, and computing power. You can't stop it. We're not going to dig into the brain, rat, the brain of a rat for the next thousand years. Maybe for another 10, 20, 30 years, but not for the next thousand years. So what is simulation-based research? Well, what it is not is computational neuroscience. It is not modeling. 
It involves modeling. It involves computational neuroscience. It is neuroscience. It also involves neuroscience. It involves a whole range of aspects of science, from physics to chemistry, computer science, computer engineering. It involves many of the disciplines in order to be able to do simulation-based research. And this is perhaps the most important point, is not to mix simulation-based science or research with computational neuroscience, as we have come to know it. So, one can think of it as a fourth branch of knowledge, the third branch being neuroinformatic-based science, because there you can really discover things that you would never have known before by correlating across data. In two years from now, it's going to cost a thousand dollars to have your, your genome on the map, on the wall. In ten years, it's going to cost ten dollars. Every single one of us will have our genome on the wall. Every computer on the planet is going to be correlating that to everything, whether you like to wear a gray sweater, whatever. Every kind of correlation possible. So, that's a third branch of knowledge. It's going to change significantly the way that we deal with ourselves in the future and medicine. The fourth branch, I believe, and it's not myself, there's many others who believe this too, is the fourth branch of knowledge is simulation-based research. This is where you gather, unify, integrate, validate, and discover, and you go back and forth in a cycle to discover new knowledge, things that would be impossible experimentally and impossible theoretically. It happens when you have a critical mass of computing power and a critical mass of experimental data. It's just a matter of time. In 10 years, there will be exaflop supercomputers. We better get ready for it. As was mentioned before, we even have to get ready for petaflop computers in two years or three years from now. So, the Blue Brain Project is a small little attempt to start driving this concept, this field of simulation-based research for neuroscience, where the overall goal is to reverse engineer systematically the brain or a piece of the brain, to database it. How should it be databased? How should you name the data? How should you organize the data? And it has to be done in a way that you can automatically build models. If you're going to build a brain in the future, build a model of the brain of 100 billion neurons, you cannot do that manually. You need algorithms to crawl the data and to dis make decisions and to build models. So you need a process, you need a pipeline, you need a, a way to integrate databasing with the structure of the data and with what you want to end up with and ultimately end up with a platform we call simulation-based research. Now, if you simulation-based research, just to emphasize again, it's really taking experiments, doing the reverse engineering, applying theory to try to put the data together in and informatics, doing simulations on supercomputers, because that's why this is possible now, is because we're getting into the, the era of where supercomputers now are affordable for doing life science research. But we need to choose a part of the brain to do simulation-based research. Very difficult decision. Should we do it on a fly? Should we do it on a snail? Should we do it on a mammal? Well, my view was, let's go for the most difficult part, which is the neocortex of a mammal, and let's get a template. Once we have a template, we'll be able to extrapolate and use that as a starting point. So the work was done over 15 years to reverse engineer the microcircuitry of the somatosensory cortex of a very young animal, two weeks old. And here you can see a nissel stain of the six layers. And this is an infrared image of the neocortex. And this is just an example of some cells stained uh, and, dis and placed at approximately 300 microns apart, which is about the diameter of these dendrites. We just call that the column for now. Let's, we can discuss that over, over dinner and debate about a column, but that's the region. Actually, this infrared picture is an infrared of the model brain, not the real brain. So 
just as a so this is the first step. One of the most difficult thing is you can take probably most of the data that is in the literature today and you'll not be able to build a model. And the reason is very simple. It's not standardized, it's not quantitative enough. So one of the things that was done in my lab over many years was to try to standardize the way that the data was collected. Both in terms of the electrical responses in terms of the morphologic, morph obtaining morphologies and three-dimensional reconstructions, in terms of mapping the connectivity, these little red stars indicate the synaptic connections, but systemat systematically mapping many different types of neurons together to get an idea of how they connected, of extracting cytoplasm and doing RT-PCR, single-cell gene expression, to find out which genes are switched on here, and in particular which ion channel genes are switched on, because these ion channel genes are what determines the electrical behavior. To stimulate these cells and to look at the synaptic transmission and to characterize all the different ways in which the neurons are communicating, the types of synapses, their strengths, their kinetics, and so on. And also to examine many of this at the electromicroscopic level, not as much as we would like to, but we will go that at the next step with, with uh, the kind of techniques and tools that Kirsten Harris has pioneered. And then, of course, you need to be able to have a composition. You need to know what, what to put into this column. We've recorded from well over 10,000 neurons, which at least gives us a starting point, but it's still certainly not enough. But it is a starting point for us to have, to start building this model. So one needs to have what we call profiles, multiple profiles across many levels. Gene expression, protein expression, electrical profiles, morphology profiles, synaptic profiles, connectivity profiles, probabilities, what's the probability one type of neuron is going to connect to another type of neuron, and circuit profiles, what is the general circuit principles that should come out once you build the model. So here's just an example of some... Can we switch off these lights? For the rest, is it possible? Just all these lights here. Because there's going to be a, quite a lot of movies, and if you want to see anything. It'll be. Okay, great, thanks. So, this is just an example. We've reconstructed many, many uh, neurons. Try to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct enough of each type of cell. Uh, if you're going to build 10,000 neurons, you, you, you don't have, you're going to need to have probably 100,000 or a million neurons to select from. Well, we don't have, we have maybe 1,000 neurons reconstructed, uh, 10, 7 to 10, 15 of each type, and you need a certain number that's just enough to allow you to clone them. So actually, this comes from slices, so they also have another problem, so we also repair them, we fix the part that's cut based on the statistics of the existing part and we clone them, which is like a bootstrap, a morphometric bootstrap, where we actually create many variants of the same type of cell. You know, if you've studied 10 pine trees or 100 pine trees, you should, if you have hired some, get some good computational neuroscientists, get the mathematical statistics to be able to clone and build many pine trees. So that's the principle there. So in principle, we can now generate a database of all the main types of cells that we have seen, at least, uh, and we can generate as many variants of them. So every neuron is slightly different. Then there's also the different electrical properties. If you record from the cells in the neocortex, you find that there's a, a whole range. You've got Morse code behavior, you have delayed behavior, you have stuttering or uh, uh, irregular behavior, you have bursting behavior. And so you have to work out how, what to do with this. And at this stage, you realize that there's a difference in lumping. You could lump and have simple classifications. But if you want to specifically build a model of neurons that have all these different types faithfully, you, you better do a lot of recordings to find out exactly how many of these types you have, how many of those types you have. The problem gets more complex because any one morphological type can actually have one of the, the same electrical type, or many others. So by combinations, we have about f over 400 different anatomical electrical subtypes of neurons. About over 50, almost 60 morphological types in the six layers. And then you combine them with electrical types, you have almost 400 types. So 
There is a classification scheme and we've tried to work with an international group and there's a very nice paper published in Nature Reviews Neuroscience on a nomenclature trying to get, it's a starting point, trying to get uh, a way of classifying neurons. We probe them extensively and that's one of the things that we did in all these experiments to probe the neurons extensively so that we can build models from them afterwards. Now, if you want to forward engineer these neurons, you better know what kind of channels are creating the electrical behavior. Well, there's a, a lot of channels, as we know. There's about 200 different types of channels that are shaping the electric, can, can shape the electrical behavior of neurons. A neuron actually chooses only about 10% of them, between 10 and 20 channels, to shape the electrical behavior. So one of the studies we did was to record from a single cell, extract the cytoplasm, do RT-PCR and find out which genes are expressed and then to look at the combinations because they form hypercomplex channels and then to correlate these with the different electrical types. Enough data, you should be able to then just look at the gene expression and predict the phenotype. And in fact, mathematically, that is what is possible. You have the gene expression patterns and the electrical patterns, you find that they are quite well correlated. When I started this project, every molecular biologist said it's impossible. There's so many steps between a gene switching on and the phenotype, you can forget about ever seeing a correlation. Well, six years later, we did see some correlation, and now we can actually calculate the amplitude of an action potential, width of an action potential after hyperpolarization, in some cases with 90, over 99% accuracy, just knowing which genes are switched on and off in a non-quantitative way. So if you had more data, you'd be able to even more accurately calculate the phenotype from gene expression data. This is important because in the future, when we want to do human brain or cat brain or primate brain, you can't do these kinds of invasive experiments. We need to learn more and more how to relate and translate from one level to the next and to the next. <clears throat> this is just an example where you have a gene expression of two cells that were normally classified as fast spiking cells. This is a delayed fast spiking cell. This is a burst spiking, fast spiking cell. And you can see they actually have an inverted gene expression. So it is important to know what the gene expression, which ion channels are used to build these different neurons um, at this level if you want to be able to build an accurate or biological accurate model of the... We can also take now the electrical properties and say we want to build this type of neuron and then we can work out which ion channels are allowed to be used. You can build, you can, you can model this with two, uh, a two-parameter equation. But that's not... It's not going to be interesting if you want to see what happens if you have acetylcholine released and serotonin and many other things happening. You're not going to, a two-parameter equation is not going to help you understand anything. What you need to do is you need to know exactly which of the ion channels that are involved in creating this. So <clears throat> ultimately the problem is reduced, it's much simpler. You take your morphology, one of the neurons that you have, and you, you say that you want to have a certain electrical type based on the composition of types of electrical neurons. And you look at the gene expression that tells you what kind of ion channels you're allowed to use if you want to recreate this behavior. And these channels are then distributed on the branches according to data, that some data, some literature, some assumed. If, it's this, if you don't have it, you flag it and you assume it. And then you read in your ion channel models. And the only parameter that has to be fitted is the density. And this is uh, work that was done by Dan Segev's group in Jerusalem. And they basically uh, pioneered this because what we said when we started this, we said, Idan, we know that it's taken three years for a PhD. It's taken a three-year PhD to build one neuron, but we need to push a button and build 10,000 almost instantly. So you had to think about this problem quite differently. Now, what is important is that you don't only want to constrain what channels you use based on one single cell PCR or some set of data. You want to integrate almost any kind of data as a constraining principle. And in theory, you should be able to constrain how you build any neuron with any other data that's obtained in neuroscience. As an example, you sh if you know the the genes expressed in different layers 
from the Allen Atlas, for example, you should say that once I built all these neurons and I put them in layers, then in that layer I should see a similar kind of ISH staining as they see in the Allen Atlas. You should be able to do that for morphologies, for electrical distributions. You should, it's in, eventually it should constrain to the total protein content or the concentration of protein per layer, almost any parameter. So the, what, the, stre the point that I want to stress here is that the approach here is what we call massively data-constrained modeling. You want to build a facility and a capability to suck in data, to be constrained by data, so that when you try to fit your neuron, you need to explore less of all the possible space. And that is one of the things that Edan's group has pioneered. It's one of these things called multi-objective genetic algorithms. The more data you can give them in the beginning about what is allowed to be used to build this neuron, forward engineer it, the faster it is that you can actually fit these neurons. Now, one of the things that they also found is that if you want to build a model of this type of neuron, you shouldn't use directly the traces. You can use features of the neuron, and that's why it's called a multi-objective genetic algorithm. But it's a very powerful approach, and it allows in the project now to actually fit automatically tens of thousands of neurons to create variations. So every neuron is slightly different as well. And this is an example, once the neurons are constructed and modeled, which was normally a very manual task, now it's done automatically, it also runs this whole probing that we did experimentally. And then it can be further checked to see just how well this model that has been created automatically now fits the, exper the entire profile, which it was not tested, it was not, uh, when they built the model of it, they did not apply all these tests. These are generalization tests. So based on that, one can be quite confident that the models are accurate representations, at least with these constraints, of finding solutions. There may still be more than one solution, but they're as accurate as you can get with the given constraints. If you can come up with more constraints, they're going to be even more accurate. And that is the goal, is to every week, in fact, add more constraints. So here's just an example, where here you can now automatically build models with 10, 20 ion channels, which was unthinkable before, in the branches, in the dendrites, and you have a neuron that has active dendrites and backpropagation that was built almost entirely manually. So, there is still a problem. F 50 years of ion channel research, a couple of Nobel Prize with, Prizes have been awarded for studying ion channels, discovering ion channels, but actually, the data that's obtained from all these different ion channels is not sufficient to build proper models. You actually have to redo on an industrial scale now because there's just not enough time and because it's possible now. But actually, you can redo the entire process of 50 years. With industrial technology, you can do it in a couple of months if you have enough money. So that's another question. But these are, about, these are the main ion channels that are needed in the neocortex. And one of the projects that we're starting is called the Channel Home Project, where you have a robot now patching and doing these exquisite uh, patch clamp uh, recordings from the different ion channels that are now expressed in oocytes. In, um, and the, the, once the data is collected, it goes into a database, and a model picks it up and it turns it into a Hodgkin Huxley model spills out the parameters. So, in principle, you can start to get... This is important because in the future you're going to want to modulate with others the kinetics of these channels. So, um, there's a lot more to this, but just the, the main point is that if you want to build neurons automatically, you have to establish workflows, you have to establish criteria, decision processes, and you have to build in all the algorithms that will make these decisions almost automatically and cue the scientist at certain stages to be able to verify that the modeling has been done correctly. So it's a constraints approach to gather constraints and ideally this will expand tremendously to gather more and more constraints and then build cells. Now you can start to validate it. So you pull a paper down from a very elegant study, a study done by Jackie Schiller's lab in Israel, 
where they record it from the cell body here and the dendrite and they inject a current here and they look how it decays. So now these models were built automatically. One has to see that they behave according to the way that people have seen experimentally. Uh, in blue is the experiment. This is an extrapolation of the data in the exp obtained in the experiment. And in red is sampling because what took them three years you can do in an afternoon. Now in the simulation you can go and do these experiments in all your neurons and plot how the voltages is dropping as it decays in the branches. You can see that there's an, a, a deviation here. And the deviation is because they could actually only record up to here. So this is a prediction, but that's an extrapolation. So in this case, although these neurons were created automatically, they actually capture most of the decay properties that you see. This is attenuation of EPSPs, attenuation of IPSPs. And so most of these neurons are actually capturing the way that synaptic potentials are decaying and changing within real neurons. So now you can calibrate basically tens of thousands of neurons. So how do you place the, near, the synapses? There's about 30 million synapses in a neocortical column. And one of the things you need to be able to decide that you've done, it, done this correctly is you need to work out where these synapses were, are. Now, this is an example of a small basket cell innovating three pyramidal cells. It looks like a mess. There's about 30, 40 contacts here, 15 in each place. It looks like a mess. But when you do that many times, you discover there's, there's a presynaptic pattern, which means what part of the axon is used to contact this pyramidal cell. And there's a postsynaptic pattern, which is which parts of the dendrites are the synapses landing on. And you have these patterns for all the different types of cells. We've tediously collected, stamp collected, all the types of data. Didn't bother to publish it because it's totally boring. But it's critical to know that once you built the circuit, that you built it correctly. So how do you build the circuit? There's been three ways. The traditional way of building neural networks, point neurons, probabilities of connections. Uh, Roger Traub has pioneered this uh, having some morphology and explicitly dictating that the innovation from here to here is on those regions. But that ignores the potential intelligence in the, in the morphology. So we build the neurons in 3D space. In 3D space, you have the composition, after recording from them, you have the composition of all the different types of neurons, and you can map them, you can stain them, and you can see that they actually would look similar if you did any kind of histochemical staining. We built an application called Blue Builder, which actually builds these neurons and can be used now generically to build any neural circuits in 3D space. It links to the database, you specify your recipe of what types of neurons you need, you push a button, and the, neuron, and the circuit starts building it. You define your macro circuit, if this is a six layer column you want to build or if you want to build a hippocampus or whatever other area. And it reads from these neurons, which have been repaired, cloned, functionalized, modeled, all of electrically active Hodgkin-Huxley models. So this way you can now reconstruct your column and this is more or less what it looks like if you look at it from above, from side, rotating. But now you have to connect the neurons. So, but before that, let me just, you can have a look a little bit what it looks like. This is an infrared uh, picture of a real tissue. This is a in pseudo in simulated infrared of the model. And this is just a fly through. What is important about this is that you realize that 90% of the brain is branches. Okay, so if you do multi-unit recordings and you're studying just what happens in these little cell bodies, there's a hell of a lot going on out there uh, that is not tractable from in the normal computational neuroscience and neural networks that have been studied. So this is really what one can potentially get to in this kind of modeling approach. So. <clears throat> But now once you put them together, according to the recipe, you need to find out how to connect them. So we do what's called an axodendritic collision detection. We find out where the axons are touching the dendrites. There's about 100 million locations where they touch. Uh, so you can then check where each of these locations and compare that with 
uh, experiments. And this was the most surprising, one of the most surprising results that came out of this, is that if you look at the number of synapses that any A, B neurons, let's say A is contacting B, and what you find in experiments is that when A contacts B, it'll, put two, it'll use two synapses in a connection. When it contacts D, it may put five on average. So there is a pattern experimentally of the number of contacts for different pairs of neurons. When, without doing anything, just building this in 3D space, you actually get automatically out a very similar numbers of synapses for all pa- possible pairs. Now previously, th- it, from uh, Mitya K- Kozlovsky's work and others, thought it only to be true for I- excitatory cells, but it's also true for inhibitory cells. So this is something that was very su- surprising because actually what it means is that if you just know morphology and you can build a circuit with the right composition, you're going to get the circuit diagram automatically. What was even more surprising is that actually you have pre- and post-synaptic innovation patterns coming out automatically in terms of which parts, which axons are involved in connections, post-synaptic. And this is just a gross way of looking at it in terms of the distance of synapses uh, as a function of the numbers of synapses as a function of the distance in the experiment and the model. But there's many more things you can do. Larry Katz does these beautiful experiments where you do voltage stimulation, and this is in the model. You can actually map all the presynaptic inputs to that cell, postsynaptic outputs from that cell, and you can compare them with Larry Katz's work. And it, it, there's fantastic correlations that you can see. You can map all kinds of pathways, and you can find that most of these are predicted because there's experiments for them. Some of them are not known, so they are predictions of what people may find, but others are deviations. Here is an example of the thin untufted pyramidal cell. These are the cells that connect the two hemispheres. They are predicted from morphology to be highly interconnected, and they are not. Experimentally, they are not. So that is a prediction that there's something else that stops those neurons from connecting. There are many other examples of how you can actually now mine the blueprint of the circuit in many different ways. So the next step is you want to capture the synaptic transmission. So the neurons are now, we've got the composition, we've got them connected. Uh, We think that anatomically it's already very close, uh, connected even without jittering and spinning and shaping and moving them. They're already well structured and connected just because they were built in 3D space. But now you want to actually model the synaptic transmission. Well, this is still done at what we call a cellular level. In fact, this whole Blueberry project at this point is a cellular level model, not molecular level. So uh, we will get there in the next phase. But one of the things that is important is that there are many types of dynamic synapses in the circuitry and each type of cell has its own rule as to whether it's a depressing synapse, facilitating synapse or linear synapse. And this is crucial because it's a map of synaptic dynamics and you can model these uh, different types of synapses. In fact, we have six main types of synapses and each type of pre and post synaptic neuron uses one, a different one. That's just an example of excitatory inputs. Then we take those, and what is interesting here is Idan has built the neurons. Idan's group has built the neurons. Now we take these neurons and put them in, and we start adjusting the synaptic currents only to obtain the right EPSPs. That's the fitting. Once you've fitted the amplitudes, you can then have a look and see how well they have managed to build the passive and active properties because you start to see that you have rise times and latencies and all kinds of kinetic properties that you never fitted for. They actually fit extremely well to experimental data. You can also then look at your conductances and see how well they turned out to match the experimental data. There are many examples where this, the whole synaptic uh, physiology actually matches extremely well experimental data, the known experimental data, and it makes predictions of the ones that are not known. So in fact, it is possible to calibrate 30 million synapses. It's not an impossible task to do. But what this allows you to do now is to, is to have a, an amazing view of the circuit. You can ask, 
what kind, what is, it, what is the view of this neuron of its circuit? Something that we always wanted to see. But here you can now sit inside this neuron and you can paint different color for all the different, approximately 400 different types of neurons that are impinging on this neuron. And you can get a picture of what the map of innovation looks like for all different types of neurons. And there are many things you can do with this. You can right click and say convert it into milliseconds and so you can actually get an idea of what latencies are involved in delivering information to these points and so on. And, and one can apply that to learning rules and so on. This is just a quick other calibration where you can ask, what about polysynaptic? We never fitted for polysynaptic. So would it work? So this is a, a, a also, it's a incredibly long study that was done by Gilad Silberberg, who is now here at the Karolinska. He was in my lab for many years doing this particular study, where he managed to record from a pyramidal cell, stimulated, it activates a facilitating synapse on an interneuron, which fires it. When that interneuron fires, it inhibits the uh, and a neighboring pyramidal cell and it causes the strong inhibition which follows a synaptic depression rule. This is facilitation depression. And then when you, if you have all three in a loop, you get that you fire this pyramidal cell, it excites the interneuron and the interneuron inhibits the other one. But it can also directly excite it, so you see excitation followed by inhibition. This is a classical disynaptic loop. It's a very powerful loop in the neocortex and it's mediated by the Martinotti neuron, this interneuron. So now after Gilly spent years doing this experiment, we can sit there in 3D with this virtual thing and just right click and say, show me all the Martinotti's, all the Martinotti loops. I know Gilly that you know, makes it a little bit trivial, but so you have a, and then you can extract your Martinotti loops and you can now compare how well the synapses are innovating, of which parts of the axon, this is the presynaptic innovation, which parts of the dendrites, this is the post-synaptic innovation from the experiment, and you can compare that in the model to see how well it fitted. And actually fits surprisingly well, this is the tuft. So you can now check that the Martinotti loop, which is a crucial loop in the neocortex, comes out automatically in the column that you built. And he has an example now. Of course you can stimulate the Martinotti, you can get many different types, but you can actually see an example of the same kind of cell, the same kind of loop that we found experimentally. Stimulate, disynaptic inhibition, and the same in the model, disynaptic inhibition. So one can do a whole series of different experiments, but let's go to something more. The next step, what about network activity? What does it look when we finally switch on this thing? That's why we got a 10,000 a uh, processor supercomputer was to try to model 10,000 neurons at the same time interacting. So what does it look like? Here is an example. <clears throat> of, it's a color code. Blue is the voltage. It's hyperpolarized and it gets excited, becomes red and then white and fires. And I'm gradually going to reveal more and more neurons in the network. The visualization is approximately at real time. The simulation is approximately at a hundred times real time. So a hundred, one second is a hundred seconds of simulation. So this is like, if, you know, after experimentally studying the circuit for 15 years, it was nice to finally see and get a glimpse of what it could look like in the circuit. But we have to calibrate and test that this is really now what it looks like. There's many different ways and views. You can apply all kinds of imaging technologies now to probe this and to see what does it look like in terms of uh, activity in the circuitry. So, but if you're afraid of the branches, we can just delete it. Right click, delete branch, look at the cell bodies. And uh, it's also a pretty impressive view. It's more like a 10,000 piano, a key piano. And you ask yourself, well, I mean, now you can start to get perhaps a, a new view on the kind of code that is taking place. What we're really interested in is the relationship between this digital and analog code. 
because most of the processing is in the analog domain. So what about some experiments? Let's take a paper from, this is in this case McCormick's paper, they see low frequency oscillations. Can we see low frequency oscillations? Poisson stimulation to the circuit. Increase the stimulation intensity, start getting a burst, and increase it further, you start to get your low frequency. Do a spectrogram, you see that you can get the low frequency. In fact, the low frequency oscillations is almost an irritating emergent property that comes out very easily from the circuit, and it's also been very easy to see that in experiments. That's what it looks like in 3D. Um, uh, our view is that there's probably going to be a lot more constraints on these low frequency oscillations than one would like to, to believe. Um, but let's take another experiment. This is a paper from Rafa Yuster. We can now do in silico type experiments. Uh, they stimulate the thalamic input, fires layer 4. At a certain threshold, the whole neocortex explodes and it spills over activity. Can you see this if you stimulate layer 4? 20 hertz stimulation, 40 hertz, 60 hertz. Suddenly the whole circuit explodes and it produces a population burst which sp spreads to the neighboring columns and many columns to the side. Now what that means is that the, what Rafa and them saw when they saw this explosive uh, activity in the neocortex that it's not necessary because there's a facilitating synapse from the thalamus because the neocortex by itself, even though there's, most of them are depressing synapses, the neocortex by itself will have a frequency-dependent all or none event like that. And then you can go further and you can say, let's see what it looks like in 3D. And then you get some more insight as to the potential or another way of doing the experiment. So now there's stimulating here in layer 4. It's a mini-columnar stimulation. And then you see the whole burst. But follow this further. Why did it stop? Oh, crashed. Hmm. Ignore. Okay. Which which file was it? Too many movies. They wanted me to put this on the computer at the back, and I thought, well, that's probably not going to work. Macintosh is normally the best <laughs> for all these graphics. Okay. I'll not, sh I'll not show that, that movie, just in case that movie is the problem. I'll just tell you that, wha actually, if you follow that movie through to the end, what you find is that there's a residual high activity in layer one. So if you actually could do a simulation before you did the experiment, you would realize that what you should have done is to do a stimulation into layer four and then have the executive top-down input into layer one coming straight after that in a time period 
which would reactivate the whole circuit. So actually it can give you a, 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 a way to actually decide what is the most appropriate and best ex set of experiments to do. But one of the things that we do in this project is actually is iterate every week at the biological level of precision. So every week we review all the flags, all the assumptions, and we say, okay, well, you know, there's an assumption here, here. We sort them by priority, and we see what aspects can be refined. So it's a whole process of ref constantly refining the accuracy of the model. And this is at one week where we're going to show you exactly the same thing, but here there was a new emergent phenomena that occurred in the circuit. And this, we don't fit, we don't try and build this to do anything. Okay, that's why we couldn't get money in the US to do this project, <laughs> because there's no hypothesis. We cannot say we're trying to build this model because this model is going to do A, B, C, and it's going to, you know, give you something really intelligent. We don't know what it's going to do, and we just want to build it as accurate as possible. So this is one week where we iterated, and I won't tell you what it is because these guys have to publish what the change is, but this is what happens, that if you now do the stimulation of the circuit, if you watch carefully here, you start seeing this looks a little bit different, and you get some activity, these things riding on top of this, so the burst that occurs when you activate the circuit is slightly different. There's something different about it. So you do a spectrogram, and this is the low frequencies, and what you see suddenly here is that actually you got gamma oscillations. This was not tuned to get gamma oscillations. We didn't care about gamma oscillations. This was just the next iteration and the refinement of the model. Tight band around 60 and, 40 and, and 80 hertz. You increase it, it stays. It's basically a resonance. There's a re the resonance that occurs at that frequency when you have a specific circuit uh, refinement, a circuit principle in the circuit. So you can see here, this is just the harmonics from the stimulation. This is the electrical activity. So unless, you know, uh, we can't really say that this is conscious because a lot of people believe that gamma is, is, is important for consciousness. Well, you can get gamma oscillations here. We don't know. It hasn't managed to speak back to us, but we doubt very much it's con conscious. But what you can get is you can see an emergent property which has been seen in experiments and we did not, des we did not target it and tune it to get those parameters. They emerge. And we can look at it further. We can look at it now in 3D. And what is really cool is you see now you're stimulating layer four, and if it, then you actually see, can start probing the mechanism of how. Now, if you saw there, what was actually happening is that it went up into layer two, three, went down, and it radiated the gamma out of layer five. I can show you. Let's look, watch it again. So it's stimulating, and now it will start gradually spreading. goes up, see these oscillations coming out of layer 5. So now this gives us a, a way we can start tracking the source of this oscillations, finding out which neurons are involved at what stage. We can right click and just ignore everything and look at a molecule, look at a neuron, look at a pathway, look at almost anything. So it becomes extremely powerful and it becomes more powerful each week when you add more biological precision. So it's a way of actually utilizing all the data that's collected in this informatics thing. So just, the point is that uh, this, uh, the whole project has many challenges. I've shown you some of them, but another challenge is an IT challenge. It's a serious IT challenge because you need to handle the electrophysiology and the workflows and the databases. It's, uh, we, ha we call them workflows. They are end-to-end -end electrophysiology workflows because you have to process, curate, handle the electrophysiology, morphology, ion channels, and then you need to be able to have supercomputers. We use supercomputers not only to simulate, but to actually build the circuits, to do the collision detection, to find 100 million contacts. This is an enormous, one of the biggest uh, uh, computational tasks. 
So you need to build the neurons with a supercomputer, you need to build circuits, you have to use data grid technologies to be able to federate a lot of the data, interactive visualization. So we have very different kinds of visualization and we're expanding this even more and it's going to be crucial and like what was mentioned uh, for the program in NSF and for the EU, interactive visualization is probably going to be one of the most important ways for us to handle information in the, f in the next 10, 20 years. It's a crucial area to support and to develop. And then analysis. So to, f to end with this, what I see, there's a lot of interesting and nice insights, but actually I think that the simplest and most important achievement in the Blue Brain project is that it's not just about building a model, it's a facility. In fact, it's dozens of applications that are linked together in a chain, in a workflow, that now allows us to build an entire a circuit in a couple of days, in a week. If you wanted to go, you, I could challenge you, you can go and try and build the circuit. It will take you several years, it'll take you about a hundred man years to build that circuit with that level of precision. But with this facility, you can actually do this now in a couple of days. And you can build any circuit in that thing. And the goal is that this should be a black box. You, because when you want to build hundreds of millions of neurons or billions of neurons, you can't go into every single neuron, every single parameter. It has to be tuned that you have biological data in here and you pop out brain models on the other side. So we will, we're exploring also with IBM and deep visualization technology, which will actually allow collaborators and, and others to, to explore this. This is a ring of databases actually the raw data, to have model data, meta-databases, and uh, finally different levels of model databases, and to allow one to do remote simulations. This requires a massive supercomputer. Uh, it could be at NSF, it could be in the US, it could be in Japan, they're building a 10 petaflop supercomputer. Hopefully all these projects can somehow find a way to, to work together. But of virtual labs, I'm convinced the future is going to be virtual labs because there's no point reproducing this in 50 places in the world. Um, one can do it. Why is this important? Besides science and discovering and so on, in, in, in my view, the funding for neuroscience is a token. It's actually, if you analyze it, and no offense, but it's embarrassing because Diseases that are related to the brain cost us one trillion dollars according to the World Health Organization and the OECD. One trillion dollars a year. So the amount of funding that we get for neuroscience to try to come up with real solutions here is actually a joke. Okay, not when you're facing such a serious problem. And in fact, what is even worse is that there's not a single disease. There's about over close to a thousand different variants of neurological and psychiatric disorders. There's not a single one of these disorders that we know what is malfunctioning in the circuit. You can have a guess that there's a gene not working or something's missing, but so what? What does it mean? How does it alter the processing? Of all the drugs that are used, there's not one drug. If you go to Parkinson's, the best characterized, you give dopamine. So what? What does it mean for the circuit? How does it change and repair processing? In my view, we can speculate until we're blue in the face for the next hundred years. We're in empirical science and you will not understand it unless you reconstruct this with exquisite detail and explore it systematically, apply the drug and find out exactly what it is that that drug does or how that disease is. And you're going to see in the future, I think, uh, simulations of different diseases. So just to end off, this is Lausanne, this is where the lab is. The blue gene sits somewhere over here. And there's of course many people involved in this project. IBM has been very helpful in uh, their support for the managing the supercomputer. One thing we did not do was to buy a supercomputer and they just went home. They, we kept them there and we worked very closely in terms of optimization. Michael Heinz from, from Yale has been very, a key part in this project because one of the decisions we made was to stop all this 50 different neuron simulators out there. 
If there's one thing we want to do in neuroscience to get our act together is choose one. And the one that I think that has been is open source, been pioneered, been tested exhaustively, why recreated is neuron. So Michael Hines has been key in this project and he's paralyzed neuron onto different, different supercomputers. It's an open source t uh, tool. He's split it so that you can break the branches onto different processors. So, uh, and, and then there's been many other collaborators. Of course, Edan Segev has been a key integral part of this project from the beginning. When we started this, everybody went ballistic. They said we're totally crazy. Except he done, of course, he recognized that this is something that has to happen, whether we have an opinion about it or not. This is going to happen. We may do it half-baked, it may not succeed, it, but it's an important step and it's going to go in that direction. So, and there's gradually more and more countries that are being involved. We've got some of the NASA people trying to give us advice how to do this as well. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Do you have some questions or comments for the for the speaker? Yes, Eric. Um, is this the end um, So, you extensively mentioned your toolbox, which is very nice. But when is it going to be available? <laughs> so the I see it as a nice software. You're crazy. You're crazy. But when is the data available? No, yes. It's, uh, it's, yeah. No, I'm not talking about the data, about the uh, toolbox. Actually. If you send a team of 10 people, we can get it into shape. It's like we heard before Robert was mentioning. You, you know, you, we build these applications. We, we, this was a proof of concept. And I think that our conclusion is actually to build a model of the brain is not a big deal. What is a big deal is you've got a scale and you have to eventually take these prototype applications and turn them into something more rock steady. That takes a lot of effort and you need organizations to support an application to go from what we call a dirty prototype into something that is used. If we had to open that today, then the only thing we would do was to serve the community, which is not a bad thing to do. We're not having a problem with that, but the, most of the data is open. People can take it from the databases and but if we have to spend 90% of our time explaining the software and the applications, and we will not be able to do the next step of the project, which is molecular level mod. So it's, that's quite fascinating and impressive. Uh, and I can understand and uh, don't have any, uh, don't challenge your strategy of getting the first order characterization of the intrinsic circuitry. But I'm curious how you see putting in the external circuits. You mentioned a little bit about layer four inputs, but what about all the feedback and other yeah. inputs? Uh, do you have a, a, a priority plan or, or game plan for uh, filling in yes. the blanks of everything that comes into that <clears throat> cortical mini column? Well, um, I think that one of the, the next steps, of course, and that's why there's a lot of discussion also in the US, this Connect Home project, and uh, the next step is to have a 3D mesh model with all the brain regions defined. And we're working with Larry Swanson's lab. Um, and there's a postdoc from his lab coming over to join. And uh, the idea is to first start connecting, getting a first approximation of how all the brain regions, in the rat at least, are connected, building the microcircuits. Uh, the problem is with a lot of the other microcircuits, they've not been characterized that well. Hippocampus and cerebellum probably still can be done, but there's a lot of missing data to really allow you to build a hippocampal circuit at that level of detail. But uh, we will start to go towards this whole brain. I think that one of, we're going, I think it's next week, there's this big meeting in New York about the connectome or trying to find out what is the best strategy to to see the long-range connections. But that is what we want to explore, is a whole mesh model. Brain regions are fined. In the Allen Atlas, they have, an, uh, I think, a very elegant and important way to define, redefine almost objectively brain regions rather than only based on initial staining and so on. 
So we will begin there and then we have to see how to handle all the connectivity between the brain regions. But the Connectome project is one. We may start something similar in terms of micro track tracing to find the connection. But the steps will be to take the neocortical column, we already can model up to 10 of them. With the next blue gene, we'll be able to model most of the rat brain, but we'll go to modeling certain regions and larger regions of the neocortex first, because that's actually not as difficult in terms of the connectivity, but it is still an issue that has to be addressed. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, you told that you use bra red brains from the day 13 to 17, but do you know that until day 21, the red brain is immature? Yeah. Well, that's not entirely true. We've done a lot of developmental studies uh, from, in fact, we've done one study where we did uh, gene expression for, of the layer 5 pyramidal cell going from P6 all the way to P60, uh, looking at the morphology and electrical properties and gene expression studies, yeah. I think. And of course, they, they, of course they, it's not complete, but it actually the morphology and electrical properties are quite advanced even at P14. But that's not the main problem. The point is what you need is you need a template. Once you have a template, it doesn't, it, even if you do it at 60, it's going to be different from an aged animal. It's going to be yeah, different yeah, from a young animal. Yeah, yeah, but till 21, you see, at least cerebellum is, is oh, doesn't look like, like it is uh, a real cerebellum. But, but you see, it's, what you, what, it's the strategy that's important. If you have the template, you yeah. anyway, you don't want to just study something at one age. You want the template, then you can start immaturing the circuits, you can start maturing the circuits and looking for differences. But to get that amount of data for every single time yeah. point is not yeah. possible. I you need a template and then I only go told that go for uh, day 30 would be better. You can't get the cellular precision with I, I'm the happy old with animals. day 16. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, this is a sort of, almost a philosophical question about the, the role but, and relative importance of understanding and predicting. So in simulation-based biology of this sort that you show, it may be possible, and it obviously is possible, to already simulate and predict the outcome. To what extent do we need to actually understand the process? Do, will the systems be so complicated that we may actually be able to simulate and predict very accurately but we may not actually be able to understand it. Or, do you, or do you, is that a I pessimistic? I think it's entirely your, your preference. <laughs> if you choose just to do a simulation and make a prediction, I think you can do that. But if you choose to dig into and to understand how, what's the mechanism by which that result emerged, I think you'll have incredible power to be able to do that, the probing technology to do it. And I think it will be far more accessible than in an experiment. That's, so that's for sure. it's really, it depends on what one is aiming at in terms of, I think. So if I'm reading your, your answer correctly, you're saying it, you're pretty optimistic about the ability to understand these models simply by tearing apart the simulation. Absolutely. I think we can already see that in terms of when we look at the gamma oscillations, we can start probing them and we can actually see what, it, we can prioritize what are the synap molecular, cellular, synaptic properties that are the most important in a particular emergent property. That gives you an insight that you can start to see, well, okay, what is the real essence of the emergence of that? When we look at the activity emerging, we can ask what's the code that emerges? Uh, we can speculate for a long time in experiments what the code is, the neural code. But here you'll actually be able to test theories of the neural code and explore them. So I think in the future we're going to it's a hypothesis testing machine. You can come up with a hypothesis or you can dig and see some principles and then go further. You mentioned um, possibly using results from something like the Connectome project with the Blue Brain project. Now in both of these cases you're dealing with results that come from averaging over a whole bunch of different experimental subjects. Take Rats, different rats. This is a mean rat, many this. column. A and of mean course, rat. Yes, and I can see, I see the incredible value in that. But of course, one of the most interesting aspects of the brain is its incredible plasticity and the ability to work around sure. even damaged circuits and things like that. So, do you see particular value perhaps of including something like the project, the Atlum project, is being developed at Harvard, where you can 
you know, look at the individual, one particular rat brain, for example, and create a map, a kind of connect home from that. Well, I mean, in, in terms of the column, what you get is a mean rat. It has no history, so it's not an individual, it's really a mean column. But once you switch on learning and memory, which is something that we will do, and this is some of the key learning principles that we'll put in, uh, you will give it a history and it'll become more individual. One of the things that is really, I think that uh, we have to pay a lot of attention to or be careful about is that uh, the environment can do a lot of things. It can change the circuit tremendously. You can probably convert yourself from being a, a psychopath into a saint, but not jump species. So there's a pow there are powerful species rules. And that's what we see as the mean, ra mean rat or mean species model. Once you have that template, you can introduce variations. And we do think in the future, you will have variations, personalized variations. If you want to build a model of your brain, in let's say 20 years from now, you take the mean human brain model and take all your scanning data, your, even your genome, you take all of this and you'll morph it and adjust it to being. So you need the template. Once you have the template, you can individualize and personalize. Thanks. In, in terms of age, in terms of evolution. Um, one question. You have shown us your, your long-term vision of the Blue Brain Project. My question would be, um, what do you think I'm not sure whether you know what IBM's long-term vision of the project is and how do you think such an effort, which is obviously tremendous, is sustainable over a certain periods of time? Yeah, I'm an eternal optimist. I don't care about sustainability. But uh, you just start it and just work very hard to keep everybody interested in it. But no, so I, be, I mean IBM's interest is very simple. This is a, 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 a thousand, tri there's a thousand trillion synapses, a hundred billion neurons and a million kilometers of fibers running on 60 watts. That's a light bulb, one light bulb. So who would not, what would you do to get your hands on a 60 watt exaflop supercomputer? It's the future, okay? It's a different technology, very valuable. That's one thing. Then something more basic is that if you want to build, simulate biology, actually even the classic technology today, even with quantum modules, because they're going to be much more class specific, they're going to do certain sets of things, you're going to need to do something very new in supercomputing. And the new thing that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to distill out the most essential algorithms for simulation. You can only distill out those algorithms through this process. So we are going to establish what we call a, it's like a little uh, cockpit, small little NASA type cockpit, where you actually see all the processes, you see all the bandwidth communication. It's like sitting inside the supercomputer as you turn on the simulation. And then you have hardware engineers, uh, computational neuroscientists, neuroscientists sitting there and f seeing where the bottlenecks are and seeing what algorithms you're using and doing what's called hardware software co-development. And the purpose of that will be to design a new processor, which we call a bioprocessor. That bioprocessor will be capable of doing very advanced biological simulations across multiple scales. So that's one of the, the, the things that we're looking at with IBM. Thanks. <clears throat> the, yes. goal of, the goal of your project is to study the activity of a, of a cortical column. So I would be interested in knowing if you are taking into account the extracellular matrix and most importantly the function of glial cells in shaping this activity. Yeah, the, the reason why that circuit looked so regular is because there are no blood vessels and there are no glia. But um, we've already prep, uh, started to prepare to put the blood vessels in and glia, and so soon you will have a blood pumping column. Okay, thank you. It's, it's not a, it's, it's not an, there are no fundamental obstacles there. So, uh, thank you for the presentation. I was really impressed and I have to admit that I was one of the 
skeptic people maybe when uh, I first heard about the project. But I, was, I have a question. Are you planning to expand also uh, this model to the molecular level, subcellular uh, level? And yeah. in terms of genes, maybe uh, you can give your vision if this is even more complex. Because, for instance, Seth Grant gave a talk that for the post snaps already have a li like about a thousand genes. So. You know, it's a question of scale. We can, with the blue gene L, we have not attempted because there's not enough memory on the processor. But with the next blue gene, the blue gene P, one can start to, pi to, start to prototype the, the approach to molecular modeling. Um, and it, it, it's just a question of getting the data more and more precise. But it's adopting a very similar strategy to what we have here. We, that is going, that's the next step of the project. We're going molecular, which is in one direction. Harvard still does animations, but I mean, the idea is to do that at the level of simulations and uh, to go towards the whole brain and to cross species. So I think that the, the problem, of, of course, sounds very difficult, but in the same way, it sounded very difficult for cellular level. For the protein level, and it will be protein, protein, the expression of genes, the gene networks, transport of proteins. But we're going about it in a specific way. We're starting with ion channels, and that's why we're so intent on having a very detailed molecular mo models of the ion channels. Because once you have those ion channels, you can then start plugging in the neuromodulating receptors because you know exactly how to modulate the ion channels. It doesn't help adding in a metabotropic receptor if you don't know that it's going to alter the deactivation time constant of KV 2.1 by this amount for that concentration, and this is the second messenger pathway. So you have to go in steps, and so we've got a roadmap to go molecular, and we think that it's feasible in the next three years to have a very detailed molecular level model. So um, I'm blown away, quite literally, by the vision and the scope of what you've accomplished here. Um, one of the things I would like to ask you is concerning the input data and how you've, how you've constrained your model. So obviously, um, you've made very specific choices about the data that you're incorporating into this, the actual choices of the, the, the constraints that you're setting. Um, and I can, I, I mean, just thinking about it, it, it seems that a lot of those would be specific for the, the model system that you're talking about. So um, because you're working in Cortex, you're, you're, you have a certain let, set of criteria that are important. Now, um, one of the things that I think would be interesting would be to ask what kind of data would you like to get from the community if you had access to any, if you could ask, um, the neuroinformatics community and actually the neuroscience mm. community to provide you with constraints, the kind of things that you would want to know in order to expand and, and develop this, what, how, what would they be and how would you specify them in a way that you could actually get that information? I think that's a crucial point and in fact that is one of the things that um, uh, have been sort of refined in this project is to precisely define what kind of data you need to build microcircuit at least at the cellular level resolution and how the data should be standardized how it should be structured what kind of curation it needs and so on so this has been worked on we have workflows for it and we've even got built lab books and ways to facilitate it so that researchers can more easily get their data into a form that's usable because I think that that's ultimately what we should as experimentalists think of is that it's not enough just to publish. Our data must be useful and for the long term. And that means that it's got to be done in a way that is as useful. And you've got to ask a question, what, what are the ways that I can, what can I do to make sure my data is going to be maximally useful? We're wasting an enormous amount of grant money and time and effort by not doing little things that would make the data ten times more useful than it is. So those are things that we, we are working on to define it and we're going to work with many other labs already we're discussing. We're going to incorporate a lot of constraints from the Allen Atlas. I think this is a, an absolutely superb data set. But, but all kinds of others from Gregor Eichler's lab in, in terms of the, the rat um, data, immunostaining data, 
uh, quantitative microdomain proteomics is going to be crucial. And so it, it, we can start defining the kind of data that needs to be acquired to build the models at certain levels and detail. Is that something you are going to? Is that something that you will publish? We have. It has to be published amongst a lot of other things. We actually have put very, the, almost no priority on publishing, so we get, get into a lot of trouble for that. Because, uh, but uh, our priority over the next couple of months is to try to publish a lot of this, the technology that goes behind BlueBrain, so that that can be out of the way, so that one can actually start um, using it more effectively. I think that lunch is dinner. Uh, when you have a model with millions of parameters and then show an example where you, know, you predict a rather low dimensional phenomenon, the, mm -hmm. the 40 hertz oscillation, uh, should I be surprised or shouldn't I be surprised? Um, or put it differently, how many parameter combinations you think mm -hmm. would still give rise to this 40 hertz oscillation, yeah. i.e., is the <coughs> type of prediction you make with the model really, you know, telling me something that you've grabbed the essentials of the circuit, mm -hmm. or shouldn't one really, in order to to bring the message home that this is the right way to go, design experiments, you know, that are far more, what should I say, you know, in a, <coughs> that are living in a far more smaller parameter space, i.e. that really test whether you've got it yes. or you haven't got it. Should I be surprised or shouldn't I be surprised? Well, as a theoretician, you should not be surprised. As an experimentalist, you should be very surprised. Now, this is a, this is a, nice, a nice question to end off before we go and have dinner, because it's probably one of the most important um, issues that can be a thorn and an obstacle to this approach in this direction. Let me illustrate it this way. If you take the number of genes, 20,000 genes, and you ask, how many different gene networks can I make? I don't know if you've ever tried to calculate that, even assuming the most basic gene-gene interactions. Well, it comes to 2 to the 400 million. Okay? Now, that is the space that a theoretician deals with. Very nice. You're going to spend a hell of a lot of time digging around different gene combinations. Biology doesn't do that. Biology chooses a subset, and it does that by constraints. If you want to understand gene networks, it does not help to apply informatics or theory. You need to find constraints. You've got to dig out constraints. And this appro approach is to extract constraints. The less constraints you have, the more true you are the more correct you are. So when, you have, when you're uncertain, it just means you do not have enough constraints. Ultimately, it's, our mantra in the lab is that the ideal genetic algorithm is a one iteration algorithm. In fact, you can almost quantify your level of ignorance by the number of iterations you need to fit. So the more biology you have and the more constraints you have, the faster it fits and there's only a very small space of possible solutions. So it is not the theoretical 10 to the millions of millions of possibilities. That is a theory space. It's not a biological space. In biology, the numbers of neurons is minute, is negligible compared to the theoretical possible types of neurons that the gene network can build. So one should not make a mistake of playing in that space because you will be lost there forever. Let's have dinner. Close the 